This is an interview for the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute's Oral History Project with Mr. Chris McNair. Today's date is May 9th, 2005. Chris, I want to welcome you to the Institute <laughs> and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Yeah. Um, Chris, just want to have a, really a, just a basic conversation. Okay. I want to talk about you and where you're from. Tell me, were you born in Birmingham? No, I'm from, uh, really from a little place in Arkansas called Fordyce. And it's about 20 miles from Bearden. And that's where I was truly born. That's right in the edge of Washtenaw County. That's spelled O-U-C-H-I-T-A. It's an Indian name. Mm -hmm. But I was really born there, but I grew up in a town called Fordyce. Were your parents from that area originally? Yes, yes, they yes. they were they grew up in, in Yeah, Florida. what happened? My mother was truly born and lived her whole life there in four days and died and buried there in four days. Mm -hmm. My daddy uh came from down there in that, in that uh Harlow um Bearden area. Mm -hmm. And uh his dad and his grandmother, they came from a plantation in Batesville, Mississippi, mm -hmm. and homesteaded on 60 acres of land down there. Mm -hmm. I've been on that land. They don't own it anymore. My folks don't own it anymore, but I have been on that 60 acres of land. You know, the house wasn't there, anything but it was out in the woods. Right. But Daddy found the spot and showed us where the house was, and there was still a little shrubbery and stuff left there from that period. Mm -hmm. And um, but we do still own uh, 50 acres there in four dice mm -hmm. uh, that my daddy bought. In fact, he bought 90 acres, and he was about to lose the whole thing about 50 years ago. And um, he called the different ones of us trying to get some money to pay it. I would have been about six thousand mm -hmm. dollars. And uh, he finally called one brother, my third brother. Uh, and he lived in Gary, and his wife was a dietitian at a Catholic hospital mm -hmm. and was in the credit union. And those sisters let her have that $6,000, mm -hmm. and she paid it, you know, paid it back in months, notes or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. But mm -hmm. uh, Daddy deeded them 40 of those 90, and, uh, but those 50, and so they owned that 40, my other brother and his wife. Okay. And um, they have built a house on the other side of the lake. And uh, as you've heard, I got a house built on this side of the lake on Alva 50. Mm -hmm. But that, that is incorporated. And uh, mm -hmm. so we had it incorporated because there's 12 of us children, you know. 12 children. Where do you fit in that? I'm the oldest. You're the oldest. I'm the oldest. Mm -hmm. And uh, we figured at some point some of us going to start hollering, I want to sell. And so if anybody wants to sell now, he or she's got to sell to one of the other 11. You can't go outside and demand a sale. Right. Because, uh, you know, uh, all of us haven't been in the same manner of success, but none of us should be in a shape where we need to sell to help our pockets, you right. know. Right. And uh, so as much as my mother and my dad have sacrificed to, send us to school and do all of that. In my lifetime, I don't intend for anything to happen to the land. Mm -hmm. How many brothers and sisters? There are 12 of us. How many, how many boys and girls? Uh, nine boys and three girls. Oh, OK. Yeah. All right, so you had a baseball team. Yeah, and the, 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 the funny thing about that, the ninth boy, he lives in Birmingham, too. And uh, he's a twin with a girl, but nine boys in a row. Is that right? Yeah, nine boys in a row, and then the uh tenth person is a girl with his ninth boy. Oh, okay. And then two girls following that. Oh, man. And that, 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 that tenth, I mean, that twelfth girl, twelfth person at least, uh, mm -hmm. she's retired from uh, Social Security mm -hmm. and is married to a preacher and lives there in Pine Bluff now. Okay. Yeah. What kind of work did your parents do? Well, my daddy was the farmer and truck farmer and... Uh, my mother was just a housewife. Mm -hmm. She taught school, didn't have a degree, but she taught school uh, for a very short time. But mm -hmm. uh, my dad, I doubt he 
you wouldn't call him maybe a good third grade scholar, but he was good with the figures. Mm -hmm. And and he must I must confess he had a lot of wisdom. Right. But as I, we talk sometimes now, some of us, and uh, we say we'd have been messed up if we'd have just had daddy raising us. We'd have been messed up if we just had mother raising mm -hmm. us. So mm -hmm. uh, we can appreciate both of them now that they're gone. But right. uh, it took both of them to do it. Yeah. And, uh, you said truck farming. What, yeah. what kind of vegetables, food? watermelons, uh, uh, peas, you know, and so all the children worked. Oh yes, Lord, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. I remember one year when I was about twelve, eleven, or twelve years old, no older than that, mm -hmm. and I made the crop what crop it was that year because Daddy got down in his back and couldn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think we had no cotton much after that, but we had some cotton that year. And the cotton got planted before he got down in his back, but I never worked the cotton. I worked the other stuff mm -hmm. and uh, did all right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. What was it like growing up in Arkansas? Well, you know, when you in that period doing it, sometimes you you don't know anything else, so you, so you, you live it. Mm -hmm. But I walked four miles one way to school every day. See, actually... Four dice is in Dallas County, mm -hmm. but we lived about a mile and a half back in Calhoun County, and there were no schools nearby. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we went to school in Dallas County. Yeah. And uh, of course, now when my brother that I was telling you that lives here in Birmingham, mm -hmm. he's you know the ninth person born. When they came along, the bus turned around up there in the yard. <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't have to do the full mile. No, huh? no, they didn't have to yeah. do the full mile. No. Well, uh, where? How far was your high school away? The same distance. It's all, the same it's all one one place. Okay, so you. And the irony of this thing is, is that we walked that four miles, and we passed by the white school where they went to school for nine months, and we went eight months. Mm -hmm. And I thought that I was pretty smart. Uh, and and went to Tuskegee. I graduated at 16 from high school, mm -hmm. and uh, when I got down at Tuskegee, I passed the comprehensive on um, math and everything, but I failed it on the grammar, or the English, mm -hmm. and I had to take a quarter of remedial English when I was down in you know, the freshman year. Mm -hmm. But I must say, it's been about 60 years now. I graduated in '49. What is that? Uh, it's read at 60, 60 years, years yes. yeah. 60 but at any rate, um, well, why did you why did you go to Tuskegee? Well, I don't have a true answer. The partial answer was there was a white lady named Mrs. Abernathy, and uh, they had a lot to do with her. Her husband was a banker and had something to do with us buying that land that we had. And, uh, but she talked about Dr. Carver and Book of Washington, and that kind of impressed me. And then I had a classmate who had had some relatives and had went to Tuskegee, and he went down too. Mm -hmm. So we went down together, and uh, so it, was, it wasn't any real drawing from Tuskegee. Mm -hmm. It was just the kind of a thing that happened, and I never will forget that Daddy and I don't, I don't know where he got it from or how he got it, but he, um, I, it seemed like to me it was $1,300 that he came up with, and that included uh, my tuition for the first year or whatever, and uh, my books and whatever. But I, was, I went on what they called a five-year plan. That was my plan that I went to school on. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so I wrote home for some money about 30 days later, and they sent me $30. Well, I was quiet until uh, right around Christmas, and I wrote for some more, and they sent me $2. And I never wrote any more. Mm -hmm. I think at that point I realized it wasn't there, it wasn't coming, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But... Um, so what was your transition like from Arkansas to Tuskegee? It was a, 
you know, it was a big difference. It was a big, big difference coming from, see, I came from the farm mm -hmm. in Arkansas, on a rural farm. I know, and when I went to Tuskegee, we didn't have any indoor plumbing, you know, all of that was outdoors. And uh, I don't even think we had a well. We had a spring that wasn't too far down the hill. Mm -hmm. Oh, I would say uh, probably from here to, up to, to Alabama Power or something like that from the house. We had to go down in the spring to get water. But um, going to Tuskegee, you had indoor plumbing and showers in the buildings. I wouldn't think too hard of them now, but hell, I That's thought it was right. all right there. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So that, that transition then was one that you sort of enjoyed because of the different things that and well, you enjoyed it up to a point. You see, I was on a five-year plan, mm -hmm. and I told you that I was 16 when I went down. In fact, I turned 17 in November. I went there in September, and I mm -hmm. turned 17 in November. And, um, uh, you know, they was cutting teas in everybody's head when we got there, you know, for Tuskegee. Right. So my roommate, uh, who was still my food ice friend, uh, we cut teas in one another's head the way we wanted them to be, you know. Mm -hmm. And we got away with that. And um, so that was kind of the beginning of uh, finding out what it was like being down there with those people. Yeah. And uh, then later on, Tuskegee became kind of an exclusive thing because, you know, they had the VA hospital over there and then they had the hospital on the campus and... So you were really right there in a black community mm -hmm. controlled by blacks, not going downtown, but right. there in that community. Mm -hmm. And um, so after a while, you get marooned off out there and you kind of forget about segregation and what the mm -hmm. world is really like, you yeah. know, at that You're point. You're so isolated from yes. the real world. Yeah, yeah. What was your major? I went down there in agriculture, and this is another indication of having good counselors. And I think I was in agriculture because I'd come off the farm and I knew a little something about it, and uh, and it had a good high school uh, principal who was also the man that taught agriculture at this high school. And so a lot of things that we took when I got down to Tuskegee, I had already had some of it before I went to Tuskegee. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, you know, if they'd had the kind of counselors that they should have had, I probably would have been in the arts or something there mm -hmm. because I was much better at, you know, drawing and, and those kind of things than some of those people who were taking art, mm -hmm. and taking uh, architecture or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, now you've become a world-renowned photographer did that start at Tuskegee? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. It, but it didn't uh, start with me making pictures at Tuskegee, per se. I became a friend of Polk, P.H. Polk. Mm -hmm. And um, I liked Polk more like a daddy than uh, a photographer. I, I admired what he was doing, mm -hmm. but I wasn't uh, caught up so much in to doing photography. And, uh, you know, they had the USO there on the campus. Uh, uh, they finally put it there on the campus. It was up on the Tompkins Hall, which was a dining hall. Mm -hmm. And uh, I worked sometimes in the USO. And I never will forget the first time down there, they had a little dark room. And I did a roll of film, seesawed it in some developer down there. Had a little red light. And when I saw that image come up on that film, I was hooked. And the, and the irony is that and photography has changed so much since then it, it ought to have another name now. <laughs> but uh, that developer was warm enough to have been good dishwater, you know. So back in those days, 68 degrees was the optimum temperature to have for developer. Mm -hmm. But uh, just seeing those images on that film was something that, that fascinated the heck out of me. Yeah. So you then was hooked. And did you do a lot of photography while you were there? Not a lot. No, mm -hmm. not, I did some, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. I did a little in the Army. Not, uh, that wasn't what I was in the Army doing. Mm -hmm. But I um, really got started. Uh, see, I went, went from Tuskegee to the Army. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and then came back and graduated. So it was really after I had graduated from Tuskegee yeah. that I started doing more in photography and uh, I was in Tupelo, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the, this, is a, this is after the service, right? Oh yeah, and after well, I graduated. Well, why, I mean, did you, were you drafted? Yeah, 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 yeah. Out of Tuskegee? Yeah. Tell me about that experience. What was that like? Well, it was, well, you would say crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, went over there to Fort Bend, and that's where I was inducted into. And, um, but see, at Tuskegee back in those days, whether you wanted to be in ROTC or not, you were in ROTC. And you you had the junior ROTC, and then you had advanced ROTC. And uh, I didn't like ROTC, period, you know. And I think that's just part of my very nature. I don't like being told what the hell to do, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And um, I had another roommate uh, named Oliver Dillard, uh, who was from here. Mm -hmm. Went to school out there in Fairfield. And I don't know where Dillard is today, but Dillard was taking tailoring in at Tuskegee, but he loved ROTC. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he retired as a, a major general, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from the Army. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, not me. I mean, I wasn't thinking about getting into advanced ROTC. When I got through that junior ROTC, y'all can keep it. Yeah. So how long were you in? In the army, couple of years. Couple of years. Um, so then, where did where were you stationed? In the Philippines. For those, what eighteen well, months, twenty well, months. Well, for the ba so. biggest part of yeah, that, the biggest part of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, now the basic training was done over in Wichita Falls, Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, was it Texas or Kansas? I believe it was Texas. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then Truman was president, and then Truman died while I was in basic training. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, not Truman, Roosevelt, Roosevelt. was president. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, so this is World War II we're talking about. Oh, okay. And uh, Truman became president. Now, you went to Tuskegee, and you said 49? No, I went Before? to Tuskegee in 42. Oh, okay, okay. But yeah. I came back and graduated in, in 49. 49. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I went to Tuskegee in 42. Mm-hmm. So you, because I, I was thinking, you know, forty nine, that would have been Korean War. You were in Second World War. Though. Did you see action in the Philippines? No, 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 I didn't. Um, uh, when I got over there, we were putting down. Uh, I was in the aviation engineers, mm -hmm. and we were laying um, runways for those small planes to land on in the jungles and all. Mm -hmm. And you had a piece of metal maybe from 8 to 10 foot or something like that. And it had little hooks on it. And you'd hook those things together. And um, that would, you know, as they were hooked together, metal with holes in them, you know, so that uh, um, so when a light plane landed, it didn't move. It, yeah, it would, it would stay there. Mm -hmm. See, and that, mm -hmm. we did a lot of that. And then we built some dependent homes and Mm -hmm. Those kind of things, and uh, uh, when the first jets that America had came over, they flew from an uh, airstrip up north of Manila called Florida Blanca Airstrip, and um, that was the air base that I was on. Mm -hmm. And back in those days, you had to have about a two-mile runway before they could take off, mm -hmm. you know, and. Uh, um, I know we'll forget how it looked up in there. This is north of Manila, but it's south of Clark Field. Now, you've heard of Clark Field. That's where they had all of that mountain erupt over there yeah. a few right. years back. Mm -hmm. But uh, we were south of Clark Field. Mm -hmm. And um, so we did a few dependent homes there. And uh, so, it, you know, we had white officers and that kind of thing. And... Uh, uh, now we'll forget we had one guy named Bing. He was a captain, and he was from Atlanta. But he was a decent guy, and we had another guy that was a first lieutenant, 
Man, his name was Kluzuski. And he was from up north, but he was a real hen. I never will forget him. <laughs> but Bing was a nice guy. And the reason I happen to mention this, this is back in the days of nobody's thinking integration, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. It's just purely segregated, segregated army mm -hmm. and all of this. And uh, when you come out of the mess hall, it would, um, back in those days, it would rarely would you have bread that didn't have weevils in the flour, you know, and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And that. Mm -hmm. uh, you would have the Filipinos when you come out of the dough, those peasants be right there to get whatever it is you're shaking off your trees, you know, mm -hmm. uh, off your mess kits. And, uh, but down there, a few uh, distant, a short distance down the road would be a white mess hall, and uh, you didn't see any Filipinos down there, but the ones that worked down there, you know. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So it's always been a discriminatory thing, man. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, so then when you then uh, got out of the military, did you go directly back to Tuskegee? Yeah, I did, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you didn't go back you didn't think about going back home? Uh, no, I might. I don't remember specifically right now, but I didn't waste much time at home if I did because mm -hmm. it was time for another quarter or something, so I went on back to school. So your, your goal was set to yeah. go back and, and finish Oh, yeah. Up. Oh, yeah. So when you finished up, what then? I went to, went to uh, was hired over the campus to go to Mississippi to teach farm veterans basic things on farming, you know, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Went to uh, uh, Oxford, Mississippi, to be honest with you. It was in Lafayette County over there. Mm -hmm. and uh, But I was at a little place called Taylor, Mississippi, and uh, I never will forget uh, the school, the, the county seat for Lafayette County was Oxford, and that's where the University of Oxford is. Mm -hmm. And Faulkner was still living back in those days. Right. And um, uh, I had a degree at this point, and uh, they had a preacher out there that was, or well, he had some college training, but he didn't have a degree. And so he carried me down to meet the school superintendent in, there in Oxford. Mm -hmm. And I went down, and I'm standing there talking to the man and asking him his questions. And, I'm saying yes and no, and not in a nasty tone whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he stopped right in the middle of that and said, where were you raised? And I thought I began to get why he was asking the question. I said, mm -hmm. well, uh, in Arkansas and part of Tuskegee, I, guess, I mean Alabama. He said, well, we got some good darkies around here. I don't want you to forget your southern discipline. <laughs> I never forgot it. And, uh, you know, it's so ironic because the right down in, in these small towns, you know, you got that circle where the courthouse is. You know? right. But right around there on the cusp of that circle is a shoe shop. And two brothers run the shoe shop, tall, white-looking men, mm -hmm. but they were black, you know, according to the system. Mm -hmm. But they got a shoe shop right there in the circle. Mm -hmm. And guess what? I didn't stay there at their sister's house the first <coughs> week or two I was there. Mm -hmm. but you, later, stayed, you had you were rooming with someone? Yeah. yeah. But later on, I got a room at their sister's house. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, she was a blonde-haired lady with blue eyes, mm -hmm. and I lived there. So I just, you know, in spite of what the superintendent has said to me that day, mm -hmm. I just want to give you the paradox mm -hmm. of this thing here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, she was black. Yeah. But white. But white. <laughs> and she told me that uh, uh, her daddy stayed at their house, was never married to her, her mother, but he stayed there. Mm -hmm. And everybody knew he stayed there. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and this is Mississippi. This is in, the in 19, Oxford, Mississippi. Nineteen forties. The 50s. late forties, fifties. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And they had um, the first place I stayed in Oxford was at a lady named Nancy Humphrey, and right up above Nancy Humphrey's house, she's down here on the street, and right up above her house in the back is is a hill, 
and I don't mean way off hill, but I mean right up above it. And that's where the University of Mississippi was, see. Mm. And Blind Jim lived either next door to Nancy or another door up one. And he was uh, Blind Jim, but he was the mascot like for the University of Mississippi ball team. And he went everywhere with the ball team. He was team. black? Black. And uh, I remember when uh, Bear Bryant was the coach at Kentucky. And Babe really was his quarterback. And I wanted to see Babe really play. And see, this is before integration. Mm -hmm. So the folks who worked on the campus, they sat in the end zone. Mm -hmm. They didn't sit on the side. But I'm talking about black folks. Right. And uh, so I remember going to that game with a white jacket on. You know, mm -hmm. working jacket, right. and so that game from the end zone. Mm. It's mm. been uh, and and uh, later on, because they didn't pay as much money in um, out there in Taylor, which is still in Lafayette County. Mm -hmm. I I got a job over in um, Pontiac County, and it was sixty dollars more a month. Well, that might not sound like much now. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't making but two hundred dollars over in Oxford over there. Mm -hmm. So when you move with sixty more dollars, that's a lot of money back that's in those days. Thirty percent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know, you come a long ways, and uh, you've seen this thing change and change and change, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, you reach this point, and you feel like you've been part of the change. And I yeah. think I have been part of the change. Absolutely. How long were you in Mississippi? Oh, uh, it must have been four or five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Were you there in '55 when uh, when Emmett Till was? No, was I had there? just come here. I think at that time, yeah, I just mm -hmm. come here. Mm -hmm. But now, let me where Emmett Till was down in that Delta. Yeah, right. And where I was was up in that northern part, mm -hmm. and even in Mississippi. It was a hell of a lot of difference in the northern part of Mississippi mm -hmm. as it was in the delta part of Mississippi. Yeah. See, the, the like number of blacks Alabama. in the northern part were small in number compared to the white folks, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, But down in the black belt there, the, the black people outnumbered the white folks. They just didn't own the land most mm -hmm. cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, If you could think about Tupelo and you think about Russ College is up the road at Hollis Springs, you right. know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Where'd you meet your wife? At Tuskegee. Tuskegee. Yeah. Okay. Now was she from Birmingham? Yeah. Okay. Well is that was that the attraction for you to no, come to Birmingham? No, yeah, finally, but mm -hmm. um see I, I knew her but I wasn't dating her. In fact I carried her to the junior and senior prom. But uh, I did that more or less as uh, think of you know whoever was supposed to care that was at some other school and didn't come or wasn't coming, mm -hmm. and uh, so she asked me to take it. So I didn't have a problem with it. But uh, we, we didn't call ourselves dating, and, and in fact, uh, the dating came after graduation, and I was gone and she was gone. Oh, is that right? Yeah. So did she come back to Birmingham when she finished? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and and you went on to Mississippi. Yeah. Well, then, what was your attraction? What? How did you get back? Get to Birmingham? Well, uh, you know, like I said, we started dating and writing letters and, and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, some phone calls. But you know, telephone was uh, an expensive item back then, so That's it wasn't right. as much phone calling. It wasn't a luxury then. No, hell no. <laughs> oh, but yeah, it was. It a luxury. was a luxury. It wasn't was a luxury. Wasn't a necessity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. 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 So you then came back came back to Alabama, and what was... Well, I came back to Alabama after uh, the job played out, and, uh, you know, Denise was born hmm. while we were down there, but she was born here, but we were still living down in Mississippi. Oh, okay. And um, uh, in Tupelo, but I was working out in Punta County, which is next to Lee County there. Mm-hmm. And um, I kind of liked the area and uh, the people that I had met there in Tupelo. 
still know some of them even today. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's it's not the <clears throat> it's much more uh, uh, urban than what where I grew up in Arkansas because mm -hmm. where I grew up in Arkansas. That's one reason I like over there now. Mm -hmm. We live in Arkansas about a mile off the main road. Oh, is that right? And when you get to on the road that comes to our house, mm -hmm. it ends there. Mm, that's so, it, huh? Yeah, that's it. So if you get there, then you you either know where you're going or you, you lost. You don't go past that. You come in there. Yeah, right? you come in there. Yeah. You come in there. And so mm -hmm. you don't have any noise. We got a lake there, about a five-acre lake. And uh, now this time of year, you'll hear the frogs at night if you outside, uh, mm -hmm. and the cricket and, and that, those kind of things. And yeah. you can't have a garden anymore unless you got it really fenced up because the deers will mm -hmm. give you a fit. Is uh, that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, what was your first job here in Birmingham? Uh, what did I do here? Mm. Oh, I worked for my in-laws at the cleaners. They had their cleaners called social cleaners. Mm -hmm. And I used to pick up clothes from people and take them there. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> finally I went to work for a company out of Ohio uh, called uh, some kind of high and why. And um, I sold books for them for a little while. and. Uh, across the state of Alabama, primarily the northern part. Yeah, what kind of books? Uh, High and Why, that was what was the name of them. High and Why. High and Why. Mm -hmm. They were books for children and... Uh... Yeah. So, um, did you teach here? I was over at Parker High School for three years. I was what they call the D.O. coordinator. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I had just gone to Parker High School, uh, hadn't been there but a few weeks, mm -hmm. when the church bombing happened. I mm -hmm. do mean a few, I don't remember how long, but yeah. it hadn't been long. What kind of coordinator? D.O., they call it Diversified Occupation. Oh, okay. And uh, I did have a homeroom class. Mm -hmm. I didn't teach any subjects, but I had a homeroom class. Mm -hmm. And what most people don't even realize is in that homeroom class, I had Junie Collins, that's the sister of Addie Collins. Mm. I had the Robinson girl who got killed in the bombing. And then uh, Junie Collins' sister, Addie, gets killed in the bombing. Mm -hmm. The Robinson girl gets killed in the bombing. Mm. And then my daughter gets killed in the bombing. Mm -hmm. So even if my daughter hadn't gotten killed, to have a class and yeah. And you get, you get to know these people. With all of them. Yeah, so it's a mm -hmm. it's a painful thing. Yeah. When you came to Birmingham, what was what was Birmingham like? Oh, Birmingham was like what Birmingham was and for a long time was. Uh it was segregated as segregated could be. And uh, so it was the Birmingham you hear about and read about and Talk about that in the Bull Corner and all of that. Was Did you ever have any experiences maybe on the buses or as you... No, not, as, not so much on the buses and things. I don't know if I ever rode the buses that much. Mm -hmm. I may have rode them some, but not a lot. Uh, but I did. Um, I made pictures of Bull Corner arresting... Uh, uh, he didn't put him in jail, uh, Al Hibbler. Mm -hmm. Al Hibbler came down here two march, two go to jail, you know, a blind right. thing out of Memphis. Yeah. And uh, I was out there making pictures that day, and uh, I got Bull Connor putting his hand on Al Hibbler, you know, holding him back and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Uh, uh, but uh, it's one of my major pictures. And then also that day, I got a policeman uh, holding... You know, the marcher's back got his hand stuck out like that, mm -hmm. and um, and his hand being stuck out like that, he, the sign that uh, he's blocking is saying, um, 
human dignity. And so it blocks whatever is up above yeah. human dignity, but right under his arm, you see human dignity. And uh, <laughs> that's, that's one of my major pictures. It's been yeah. a good seller. Yeah. yeah. Well, when, when did you actually start your, your career in photography? When did you open your first shop? Oh, I opened the first shop uh, in 1962, okay. April the 9th, 1962. I, I um, uh, made a picture of a guy named Pinker. I uh, can't remember where Pinker worked right now, but anyway, he needed a picture. And I wasn't, the shop wasn't quite open and finished for me. Uh, Oliver Pearson owned a little place where I started. So I started. In business, just three doors from where I am now, okay. up the okay. street up there. Close yeah. to the Center Street. No, cl yeah, close to First Street. Close to First, yeah. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> and um, so he needed that picture, and he came by there, and I made the picture with him sitting on a sawhorse. Yeah. And that was the first picture that I made in there. And uh, so I stayed in that place 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then in 1962, I built... Uh, the first part of where I am now, mm. and that was 30 by 70 in size. Mm. I had an SBA loan and uh, uh, didn't know much about architecture as I do now. And uh, um, I had a little money in there for contingencies, uh, discretionaries, mm. but I spent it on making sure that I had a basement that I didn't know I was going to have there. Mm. And I had to stop from, from filling it up with dirt, and mm -hmm. so there I went my little discretionary money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand that. Um, Denise was the oldest child. She was my only child at that time. The only child, right? Mm -hmm. um, where were you? Did, did you go to church that Sunday? Yeah, I went to my church. I was a member of St. Paul Lutheran Church. Mm -hmm. Over that one block down from my studio, oh, okay. and uh, <clears throat> that's where I was a member. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, I heard the blast when it went off, and uh, it was an overcast day. And my brother was sitting right behind me in Sunday school, and I asked him, "Was that thunder?" And he said, "I don't know." And uh, then, by the time Sunday school was over. Somebody had found out what it was, and they told the pastor that 16th Street had been bombed. Well, at that point, a lot of things had been bombed, you know, but nobody had ever been killed in any of the bombers. Nobody might got killed out in the street for some of the disturbances, mm -hmm. but nobody had ever been killed. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, so I uh, knew that my wife and daughter were going to church and um, to 16th Street, and but I walked one block back down to the studio and got some film and a camera, and I then proceeded to hitchhike over to uh, 16th Street, and I never got quite there. I got it there at Gaston's uh, building, you know, restaurant and all, yeah. motel. And they blocked uh, the streets off, man. Well, I don't even know where the streets were blocked off. I imagine they were. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but uh, Helen Brown, who was uh, uh, well, who is my wife's cousin, mm -hmm. you know, lived just one block up the street from us out there in Roseville City now. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it used to be Roseville City. And she had drove up just about that time I got there and said, come on, go with me. And said, we can't find Denise. And so we went over, I said, where are you going? And she said, we're going to the hospital. So we went over there, it was Hillman at that time, and uh, we uh, saw another cousin, and uh, he had rambled around in the hospital there and had found the room they were using as a morgue. And he carried us in there and showed us the four children laying up there on the table, dead, and Denise was one of them. And, uh, we, if you looked in that uh, memorial room we got set up over there and now, you saw in one of those cases a uh, piece of mortar. Yep. Well, that was what was smashed in her head. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That, 
Was your wife there that day? Were you and your yeah. wife there together? No, 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 no. I told you I was in the Lutheran church. She yeah. and Denise were at this church. Yeah, so she had. Yeah, but um, she, no, but she, <clears throat> she, I don't even know if Helen had seen her or not, but uh, uh, at that moment. But yeah. uh, she wasn't with Helen. When, and, and I got in the car and went on over there with Helen. Mm -hmm. And we just found her uh, over there. Um, in fact, I said I got in the car, I took the steering wheel, I drove over there. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Mm. What What do you remember about the um, the services that I know Dr. King came in and he preached? Yeah, well, I know what he said now because I have a book by James Washington, I believe it is, that has uh, most of King's speeches and right. uh, talks in it, and it's a very good book. And uh, But in there, the eulogy from the funeral is in that mm -hmm. book, mm -hmm. and I've read it uh, since then. But, it's, if, but without that knowledge, no, I couldn't tell you what he said. Mm -hmm. uh, no, but I know what he said now because I read the story. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Now, Chris, I know you, in times after that, I know it must have been really, really difficult to just uh, just move on. Well, <clears throat> it's difficult to move on even sometimes now, mm -hmm. but uh, the survival tactic uh, wasn't so much moving on uh, with Denise in mind as much as it was trying to help others. Mm. And my efforts to help wasn't based on race. It was based on helping people that need help. Uh, you know, when I say help, I don't mean like the panhandler, you know, getting a dollar or dime or 50 mm. cents out of it. I don't believe in that. But I'm talking about trying to get somebody in school, uh, uh, and into a house, or keep them from buying a house that doesn't make sense, uh, renting a house that they're gonna cost them more to rent it than it is just a monthly thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's been a big part of my life. And, uh, uh, you know, when my daughter got killed, I think um, it must have been three or four months before I even cried. I think I was just that shocked, that out of it, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I, I think I was in my right mind, but as far as an emotional, uh, oh Lord, they done killed my child, yeah. and I, I, I don't think that hit me at that point, you know. I mean, of course, I'll even cry today, and it's been some 40 years, uh, 42 years ago, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, I'm relaxed enough to cry. Yeah. And you may want to know about my anger. I had the disgust, and I still have the disgust. But uh, I think that I've had enough sense over the years not to fall prey to the disgust for the people or the persons that I needed to hate or to kick or to kill or whatever. Uh, they wouldn't know anything about it, so I'd be punishing me, you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and... Uh, so when it comes to um, dealing with human beings, I don't say I know all about them, but I'm a pretty good judge of human beings. And evil in this does not come in a certain race or color of people, right. and even a, a nationality, if you want to put it that way. Mm -hmm. So you have to judge people based on this person and that person, that's the way you do that. Mm -hmm. You can't, you, you'll even run into some situation where you virtually can't stand the wife or the husband of somebody, mm -hmm. but you like the other person, mm -hmm. you know, the other person brings something to the table. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so that's the way it has been with me. I, I, I know I've done some things for some black folks and, uh, I recall I had a loan. This hadn't been too many years ago, but it was at Amsouth Bank, and uh, my loan man was retiring. <clears throat> and the lady 
that was his assistant had always been the one to do the work anyway, you know. Mm -hmm. So when I went there this day, he wasn't in. He hadn't, hadn't left the bank yet, but we got to talk. And uh, I said, with him retiring, are you going to move up into his spot? She says, oh, no. I said, I uh, only have a high school education. She said, I came here right out of high school. I said, but you do the work. She said, yeah, but I don't have a degree. And she was married with a family, you know, mm -hmm. children by grown. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, why don't you go to school? She says, I'm too old now. I said, oh, no. And about that same time, you know, Beverly Baker, mm -hmm. I had had a similar conversation like that with Beverly, but it wasn't in it. But Beverly had just gone to school, too, you know, mm -hmm. a little mm -hmm. before that, and had come out and graduated right. and became a lawyer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and... Uh, uh, so I talked to that lady, and I talked to a very firm. And I was in the bank years later, and I saw her, and she had gotten a degree purely because I had talked to her that day. Mm -hmm. And she was happy and was thanking me for having talked to her that day. Mm -hmm. So I've done a lot of those kinds of things, mm -hmm. and... Uh, but I deal with you based on what you bring to the table. That's mm. who I am. Now, Chris, you were one of the first blacks to be elected to the state legislature. What led to that? Well, <clears throat> the truth is I wasn't the first. Tom Reed and Fred Gray from Macon County, yeah. they were the first two. They were elected in 1970. I ran in 1970, mm -hmm. but I didn't win in 1970. Mm -hmm. So... Two years later, Tom Glower had uh, become a county commissioner, and he was in that best mayor, and I was in that best mayor. So I was running for the spot in 1972 that he had had. Mm -hmm. And um, I even talked to Mason Davis about it, because Mason Davis ran in 72 when I ran. Mm -hmm. 1970, I mean, when I ran. Right. And we both lost then. And... Uh, so I told him I thought I was going to run for Tom Glower's spot there. And he advised me not to do it. He said if I ran then and lost, I'd just be dead. And I talked to David Van, and David Van encouraged me to run. And David Van was encouraging me to run for two reasons. He said they're going to redistrict. And if you can run now and win, says when they redistrict, you'll have it on the other blacks that come to the legislature. Mm -hmm. And David was correct mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I did win. And uh, next year or two or whatever it was, uh, Earl Hilliard, uh, Tucker, uh, uh, what's the boy that works for the mayor? Ron Jackson. Yeah. Um, anyway, it was six of them. Mm. I made the seventh one. Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine Earl Hilliard and Ronald Jackson and Tucker all being with me. Mm. And and, and uh, what's this other boy, tall boy that lives in D.C. now? Uh, yeah, Harrison. Har Tony Harrison. Mm -hmm. Well, all of them say I, I had the seniority at this point. And, um, in fact, I'm the one that encouraged Ron Jackson to run. That's another story. Mm -hmm. And uh, But, at any rate, uh, we were able to convince uh, another guy, a white guy, uh, to uh, be the vice chair. And uh, so he had to vote with us. And we had a guy out of Homewood... Uh, and he was just a Leonard, Tom Leonard, and he was just with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there was um, um, the boy from, uh, he's dead now, uh, he was from Bessemer. He's the guy that beat me in 1970, mm -hmm. but told me he would be with me if he didn't. He wanted to be chair too, but if he didn't, he, he would vote for me himself. Mm -hmm. But he told me that he couldn't deliver those other white folks. I could deliver 
seven votes to him, but he right. couldn't deliver anything to me. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, uh, we went in there and, uh, and had about seven ballots. And on the seventh ballot, a uh, guy named Jack Hopkins, white guy, he's dead now, but he was a union guy. And he voted for me, I found out later. Mm -hmm. And that made me have 11 votes. And uh, Jabbo Wagner was the guy I was running against. And uh, so I became the chair. Mm -hmm. And that's how that happened. And, uh, mm -hmm. But um, you learn a lot about um, your people, their people, and everything when you uh, get to be the chair of a delegation like that at that time, yeah. especially. Yeah. Yeah. How did you aspire to become? Were you involved in the community before you got involved in, in state politics? Not that much, not that much. I even went to Peter Hall and asked Peter Hall about running. Mm -hmm. I asked Dr. Pitts about running. You know, I checked with all of them, and mm -hmm. none of them had anything against me running, but uh, I ran. And, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. um, so how many terms were you, were you in? I was there parts of three different terms. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then after you came back home, then you went to the uh, county commission. Yeah, well, I, was, I, I did. Uh, but the, the first thing, after my first full term, you know, when I got elected the first time, that was a partial term. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> when I got elected from the district, you know, and became the chair, well, that was a full term, and uh, so after that, I didn't, when that term was up, I didn't run for re-election. I ran mm -hmm. for the st state, um, for the Congress, U.S. Congress. Right. And that was, believe it or not, was against Richard Shelby, and then the years later, you know, I ran against Richard Shelby mm -hmm. as a state, as a U.S. Senator. Mm -hmm. That's when you were not supported by some of our... Uh, well, yeah, our Joe people. Reed didn't support me, and... Uh, I'm not sure where Richard Arrington was. He gave me a contribution, but I'm still not sure where he truly was in that case. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Earl Hilliard, you know, he was running for Congress at that time, and uh, he did make it. And I think, uh, er, I mean, H uh, Hilliard, not Hilliard, but uh, Shelby had uh, helped him out with some money along the way, so I don't know how that worked out. Yeah. What's been your greatest satisfaction in your political career? Well, on the county commission, uh, it, that was the greatest satisfaction. Um, I think I was a good commissioner, uh, in spite of what you know you heard him say in recent years. But I know I ran a tight ship, and I know I was good for the county, and I know all of the things that they have said are not true. And uh, uh, you know, sometimes you get uh, more than frustrated when you see him turn loose a guy like the guy that bombed the uh, uh, clinic up there and then bombed Atlanta and, you know, and uh, killed those people and wounded a lot of other people and then they give him life sentence. Uh, you know, that's super frustrating to you, you know, when you've been a good citizen all along. And just to even run your name through the paper with that kind of thing is, is awful frustrating, you know. Yeah. Well, Chris, you've, you know, you've uh, done a lot for the community. You have a thriving business. You have two daughters. Yeah. Tell me, talk well, about Well, I think that them. would be, if I have a real plus, it would be my two daughters. Uh, and they don't do everything the way that I do. You got two children, so <laughs> you got to know they don't do it all. But uh, mm -hmm. to be able to be seeing them run the thing in today's manner uh, is uh, a great joy. And uh, my wife and I both, we uh, take a lot of pride in seeing that happen. Mm -hmm. Well, Chris, I know you've taken time out of your busy schedule, man. I really appreciate you coming and sitting with us. I'd like to do this one day when we just have all day because I know you've got a lot more to say. Uh, but I appreciate you, and at some point we may want to try to do it again. Okay. Okay. All right. Appreciate it.